Wow. <laughs> I'm not used to getting that kind of reaction. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. My name is Parker Snow. I serve as Executive Director of the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship here at Haverford College. And on behalf of the CPGC and the Office of Multicultural Affairs, I'd like to welcome you to an evening with John Carlos. Um, before, before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping uh, announcements. First of all, um, there will be a book signing in the lobby outside here after the event with uh, Dr. Carlos. He'll be signing his memoir entitled The John Carlos Story, The Sports Moment That Changed the World. So I hope you can stick around. We do have a little bit of refreshments out there too. Also, if you would take a minute now just to turn off or silence your cell phones, that would be very, uh, we would be grateful for that. Uh, oh, here's the book, yes. Okay. Can we, can we keep that book? Don't worry when I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a copy of the book so you know what it looks like afterwards. All right. And then also, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, um, we, the, tomorrow at 1230 in Sharpless Auditorium will be our, I believe, our first TEDx event here at Haverford. Uh, and uh, John Carlos will be part of that as well. Uh, but uh, please come tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. in Sharpless Auditorium to be part of the uh, TEDx event here at Haverford. One o'clock. I was told 12.30, but... Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm especially delighted tonight to introduce um, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Kitroff, who's going to be serving as, I guess, the co-discussant and moderator of tonight's event. Um, Professor Kitroff is an associate professor of history here at Haverford College. He was born in Athens, Greece, educated in England, where he received his doctorate in modern history at Oxford University. He's taught at Queens College in New York, Princeton University, and NYU. He came to Haverford College in 1996, and where he now teaches here at Haverford courses in European and Mediterranean history, and he teaches a very popular course on sport and society. He researches modern Greek history in a range of fields from politics to sports. His publications include a history of Greek soccer and a book on modern Greek identity and the Olympics. So we thought it was very appropriate for him to be our moderator tonight. The topic of the Olympics is a topic where he has lectured on at the International Olympic Academy and at many colleges and universities across the United States. So I want to thank you, Alex, personally for coming tonight and being part of this event. Thank you. I'm also going to now turn the microphone over to my colleague, Stephanie Zuckerman, who is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I'm really excited that we had such a great turnout. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, my personal connection to Dr. Carlos, my stepfather, Edwin Roberts, was a runner for Trinidad and Tobago and a frequent competitor of John's and finished fourth in the race that we're going to see tonight that led to this moment. So, uh, so he was, he was <laughs> point three seconds. He was, he was coming too. Well, he was coming. <laughs> Ooh, hey, it was. <laughs> So I've been hearing about this my whole life, so I'm really thrilled to hear, to hear about this through your eyes tonight, John. Um, so Dr. Carlos is a member of the USA Track and Field Hall of Fame. Um, he competed in the 200 meters, earning a gold medal in the 1967 Pan American Games and a bronze in the 1968 Olympics. Uh, he led San Jose State to its first NCAA championship in 1969 with victories in the 100 and 220 and as a member of the 4x110 yard, yard relay. He also set indoor world bests in the 60-yard dash and 220-yard dash at the 1967 Pan Am Games. In 1969, he tied the world record for the 100 meters in 9.1 seconds. Track and Field News recognized him as the world's fastest human in both 1969 and 1970. In addition to track and field, Dr. Carlos is known for his dedication to social justice. He's a founding member of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, which in 1968 made a series of demands on the International Olympic Committee for racial justice and equality. In 2008, Dr. Carlos was a torchbearer for the Human Rights Torch, which ran parallel to the 2008 Summer Olympics Torch Relay and focused attention on China's human rights record. 
In 2011, Dr. Carlos spoke to a large crowd at Occupy Wall Street. He said, today I'm here for you. Why? Because I am you. We're here 43 years later because there's a fight still to be won. This day is not for us, but for our children to come. But he's best known for one of the most famous moments in Olympic history. After winning the bronze medal in the 200 meter race at the 1968 Olympics, he and gold medalist Tommy Smith raised their black glove fists in a powerful display of resistance in protest of racial injustice and economic inequality in America. So before Professor Kittroff and Dr. Carlos begin their conversation, we'd like to begin the evening with a short video clip um, that will help put some historical significance on that moment. And the video was put together for Dr. Carlos and Tommy Smith when they received the Arthur Ashe Award for Carriage at the 2008 SB Awards. So. Here we go. I want to see this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a chance to look. Well, 1968, the year Bill Russell, the NBA's first black head coach, led the Celtics to a world championship. Bob Gibson won the Cy Young Award. Denver's Martin Briscoe became the first African-American starting quarterback. They played in a country that applauded their efforts on the field, yet denied them equality off the field. 1968 may have been 40 years ago, but for many of us, like me, a 19-year-old college student at the time, the events are so vivid, so personal, they could have occurred yesterday. As thousands of lives were lost in Vietnam, decades of discrimination and oppression exploded into streets filled with poverty and rage. This would lead to a bold action by two members of the United States track team, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Tommy Smith was the seventh of 12 children born to immigrant farm workers in Clarksville, Texas. His earliest memories are of working the fields with his family, struggling just to have food on the table. John Carlos was raised in the city, in the hard streets and poverty of Harlem. Their backgrounds may have been different, but they united to make a statement before the eyes of the world. As Arthur Ashe himself said, I respected the way they stood tall against the sky and insisted on being heard on matters other than track and field, on matters of civil rights and social responsibility. I couldn't help but admire them. In a turbulent era, they provided a powerful gesture, a silent statement of pride and unity after so many years of racism and prejudice. It's hard to explain just how violent the 60s were. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. Keep them moving out, keep them moving in black, because of the color of the skin. was a volcanic eruption at almost every level. That's what the world is today. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many guns you killed today? In the States, that is the shaking of the foundation of American civilization. City, site of the 1968 Summer Olympics. The games began as a new sense of black consciousness had already taken hold among African American athletes. There had been talk of an Olympic boycott, but ultimately the athletes decided against it. Still, many of them felt the need to make a statement for human rights during the games. Not a day passed that somebody did not confront you with. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? 
We had this platform, this stage. The world was looking at you, so wham, there it is. People were really kind of nervous, and nobody was more nervous, of course, than you know these these old white Olympic officials. I think that everybody was prepared for something stunning to happen. But who among them would step up? By day four, no one had. Then Tommy Smith and John Carlos took their place for the 200 meter final. There's Cuesta, it's a good start. And Carlos, as usual, has burst out of the blocks. Tommy Smith running pretty well so far. And in lane two, Bombuk is strong on the outside. It's Edwin Roberts. It's John Carlos right now. It's Carlos and Smith. And here comes Tommy Smith. Smith has done it with his hands in the air. Tommy Smith had set a new world record. In the tunnel, before the medal ceremony, few words were spoken. They walked to the medal stand with their shoes off to symbolize the poverty of their youth. Tommy Smith accepted the gold medal. John Carlos, the bronze. As the national anthem began to play and the American flag was hoisted, Smith and Carlos bowed their heads and raised a gloved fist into the night air. My prayer was a prayer of solidarity a prayer of hope uh, that we could unite as a people instead of being separatists uh, in a country that's supposed to be one. Well, once we turned uh, to leave, I really started thinking hard about, you know, the fact that I was a free man, that they would never put shackles on me again. If they didn't want to be thought just as people who could run faster, or jump higher. A lot of people thought that was just black power. No, that was black people affirming their dignity. So it wasn't anti-American. It was anti-injustice in America. But for Smith and Carlos, the reaction was swift and severe. They were stripped of their place on the team and sent home by their own country. The International Olympic Committee said you will either take them off the team by five o'clock, or you will not be in track and field for the last two days of the competition. Smith and Carlos were vilified as militant radicals, but their personal sacrifice had just begun. There would be death threats and hate mail, and long afterwards, isolation and unemployment. Years of desperation and anguish for themselves and those they loved. Tommy's career was, couldn't get a job. He ended up moving in with me. He had lost his apartment, his, his wife had broken up, and he came with a suitcase in his hand. My parents were being harassed mercilessly, mercilessly. There was real concerns around our safety. So he suffered, and he suffered for years. It chips away at your manhood. After a while, you get to the point where these things are so prevalent to you, you hate to look at the guy in the mirror in the morning. It's just amazing how a country can quickly turn that you win a gold medal for your country, and yet as soon as you take that stand and identify yourself as being proud of who you are, then you're condemned. Four decades ago, Tommy Smith and John Carlos use their moment of Olympic victory to remind America of a greater battle yet to be won. Now at San Jose State, where they train together, there's a statue in their honor, a statue that shines a light on our appreciation for their message of human dignity. They could just as easily have stood there with their hand over their heart, the national anthem playing in the background, but to represent their country and say, I want to run for America, but I want America to understand who I am. And it took a lot of courage for them to do what they did, a lot of courage. I think most black would probably tell you that day was, was a great day for them because it probably gave them some hope that, uh, you know, we're going to be able to overcome. 
they were willing to sacrifice themselves for something far greater than a gold medal or a bronze medal. The fundamental lesson of what they did is courage. Courage to think for themselves. And it's the courage to hope. Because what they did was this is a sign of hope. And that's that's a beautiful thing. I'm uh, profoundly honored and privileged to be sitting here next to John Carlos this evening. The Black Power salute is inscribed in our collective consciousness as a supremely courageous act that affirmed human dignity and a belief in the cause of racial and social equality. As a historian of the Olympics, I know very well it is the signature image of uh, the history of the modern Olympic Games. And it's a reminder of how sport can be used as a vehicle for social change. And John Carlos's dignity and perseverance for almost two decades, during which he was vilified, as we heard, isolated, victimized, is also a source of inspiration for us, as is his present day struggle against inequality. Uh, I've spent most of my life in uh, classrooms and auditoria, so. Uh, it takes a lot for me to get nervous in front of a uh, it, it, talking in public, but but um, we are in the presence of of uh, of a living legend, uh, a hero, a the quintessential angry black man that the white establishment uh, vilified. I've now spent a good part of today with John Carlos and. I, uh, just a bit earlier, I offered what I hope was a compliment. I told him he had a mild professorial demeanor, as if he'd lived all his life in this wonderful, leafy, quiet campus and not, had, and not suffered all the, the experiences that, that he had went through. So now I think my task is to stand back as much as possible and let him speak and let you ask questions. I would like, though, to ask a couple of questions in the beginning uh, to get the trajectory of John Carlos's life in perspective. Um, the beginning, uh, the hard life in Harlem, and how he became a runner there, there. how he moved to East um, Texas State University, where he became, began his college running career, <laughs> then to move on to uh, his running career uh, the 200-meter race that we saw in the Olympics, the medal stand ceremony, all the awful things that followed later, and then the gradual and steady recognition and redemption and, and acclaim that John Carlos received. And I want him also to talk a little bit about what he's doing uh, these days as, as an agent for social change. So if I, if I can start with the first question, how did you and when did you become a runner as you were growing up in Harlem in, in conditions in which hardly helped people realize any type of sporting and running potential? Well, uh, I'd have to say before conception, before, you know, before my mother actually gave birth to me, I was moving all the time. My feet was moving. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm literally telling you the truth. They had to do this procedure with my mother three times. The doctor told my mother, say, this baby's moving around, Mrs. Carlos, and we're going to have to do a special procedure to move this baby back into its proper position, or he might break his legs or his arms. My mother said, fine. They did the procedure. By the time my mother can get from the hospital back to my house, at that time, I was born in Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, probably <laughs> roughly 30 minutes from my house to the hospital. By the time my mother got back, from the doctor moving me around, I moved back to where I wanted to be. <laughs> so then my mother had to go to the procedure two more times. The doctor said the third time, said, look like this baby has a mind of his own right now. It's going to come the way he wants to come. 
Well, I came in with these big 13s. She was not first. <laughs> so that was a prelude to the fact that I was going to be involved in something with my feet. My father was a cobbler, a shoemaker. So it all, everything fit. Uh, relative to me being a runner, that was something that was sent down from the heavens from God. I never had any aspirations to be a track star, although I knew I was a star because I was gifted in so many different uh, talents in athletics. I wasn't as gifted as I should have been or could have been in school. And a lot of people say, you shouldn't say that. Why do I have to say it? Because I look at myself in terms of saying I'm one of the most brilliant guys that's on the block. I couldn't spell block at the time. <laughs> but I could debate with anybody on the block. So then I had to rely on what talents do I have? What gifts did God give me? A thing called athletics. I got turned on athletics because in my early days in life, for most of you guys was born into the TV era. I was born into the radio era. So my television was the radio. And I heard them talking about this young lady swimming the English Channel. Well, I was a swimmer. I was the best bathtub swimmer in Harlem, <laughs> by far. So when I heard about this woman swimming the English Channel, I was intrigued. Hey, Pop, what's the English Channel? Why is she swimming the English Channel? What's she doing when sharks come? She swim with a knife in her mouth? <laughs> what happens, Daddy, when she has to go to the bathroom? I didn't know they'd bring you out the water, let you do it, yet, then drop you right back in. What is she doing it for? Does she get a trophy? Does she get money? Does she get recognition? They write up on the paper. He said, collectively, son, I think she gets a little bit of all of that. I'm going to swim the English Channel. <laughs> Not too long after that, I heard them across the radio talking about this Olympic Games. Hey, Pop, what's the Olympic Games? Well, son, that's when all the nations in the world bring their best athletes forward. I say, for what? He says, well, it's like war games. You know, if, if you can show physical superiority, then that it's you the baddest in the world. So, so they have this contest every four years. Well, my thing was swimming. I didn't know anything about track and field or boxing or anything at the time. Pop, did they ever have a black swimmer? No, son. Great, because I'm going to be the first black swimmer to represent America. <coughs> and that was my ideal. That was my dream. That was tattooed to my heart. I grew with this thing for a couple of years, and then one day my father says, time that we have a talk. He says, son, I don't want to rain on your parade, but you'll never go to the Olympic Games as a swimmer. What are you talking about, Pop? I'm the best in New York City. I'm the best 200-meter freestyle swimmer in New York. I went to get my one medal. That's me, Pop. He said, no, nah, son, you won't be able to go. And I said, why? And he kind of rubbed on his hand. I thought he had a bug. But in essence, what he was telling me, he said, merely because of the color of your skin, son, you're not going to be able to do what you want to do in life. Well, just imagine a young kid having a dream or vision of himself doing something, and then your father or someone in the family come and tell you, you're not going to be able to do that because your name is Carlos. Or you're not going to be able to do that because you, you have curly hair because you're a Catholic or Protestant. And I took it kind of hard. My father looked at me and he said to me, he said, well, son, are you going to give up? I said, no, Papa, I'll just find another way. Then I went into boxing. I was best powerhouse, both hands. Still got it, guys. <laughs> anyway, I went down to the Golden Gloves and I got involved in them and beat up a few guys and the guy telling me, said, man, you're a pretty good boxer and look like we can get you to go pro. Well, all the time I was sneaking doing this boxing, I would never tell my mother and father, but now they tell me I'm going to go pro, I have to tell them. And I go to my father and tell him, say, Pop, I've been going down to the gym on 125th Street. They tell me I got a pretty good game. I want to box. Fine with me, son you got to get by your mother. Went to my mother. My mother said instantly, no, I won't have it. You're my baby boy. I will not let them break your face up in that ring. I said, Mom, but I'm good. She said, you have to promise me that you will never box. 
And I was telling her, I said, Mom, all I want to do is make a million dollars. If I make a million dollars, I know how to make money with money. They have to spend $110 million to find me if I get one. <laughs> no, son, promise me that you won't box. I left boxing alone. And it was an epidemic of drugs. <clears throat> Not like the drugs you have right now, the cocaine and free basin and all that. This was spiking, heroin, smack, dirt, or mud. It was a professional drug where entertainers used to use it. It didn't sprinkle down to the kids. Most of the adults in the neighborhood couldn't get a hold of this drug. But all of a sudden, you go to sleep one night and you wake up the next day and it's an epidemic of drugs. It looked like they put them in little balloons and just dropped them out the plane. Because then I began to realize that all my friends that have mothers and fathers are the same as me. All of a sudden, the fathers were missing in action. A lot of them became dope fiends. Mothers were struggling to stay afloat, but at the same time, they was chippy in too because they had a big load on them to raise their kids, to be the breadwinner, to provide for them with no assistance. Now, you think there's welfare when you say assistance. Well, it was welfare. But welfare was like coming over on the maiden voyage and then telling you, say, oh, man, what we did in the maiden voyage was wrong, and, and, and we're going to make restitution, so we're going to give you welfare. Or in modern time, they call it social services. Well, imagine being on welfare. You're a single parent, but you need love, too. Even though your man don't live in the house no more because he's out in the streets, you're still in love with him. So from time to time, he'll come home, and you're damn happy to have him home. But when that welfare lady or man came to the house, before they would greet you or the kids, they'd look under the bed to see if they see a man, slippers or shoes under there. they look in the closet to see if they see his trousers. they look in the ashtray to see if they see a cigar. And the first thing they would tell you, Oh, I see a man has been in this house. We're going to cut your services off. So now it's a bad situation. No men in the house. The women are afraid to move. Then there's a lack of product. And when I say product, I'm talking about food, thing that everyone needs to eat. There was a lack of clothes, textiles to wear during the school days. And there was a guy that came on TV that I was very impressed with. White guy, I wore a green outfit. I think he traded my life to my color was green after that. Called Robin Hood. <laughs> I just left England. And when I was in England, I went to Nottingham over there to see if this guy was real. <laughs> and you know, they, over there, they don't know whether he's real or not. But I saw the Earl Flynn on TV, my hero, Robin Hood. And then when I saw Robin Hood over there, he looked like my little fat brother. <laughs> but the concept of Robin Hood stood out in my mind so strong that he wasn't concerned about the sheriff of Nottingham. He was concerned about the well-being of all of the people. So he decided, I'm going to take from the rich and give to the poor. Well, I felt like those guys that owned those freight trains that was running through Harlem every day bringing frozen food and bringing these clothes and bringing everything in, I felt like they needed to pay a tax too. So then I went to investigate, and when I saw what it was, I said, all the people in the neighborhood need this. They didn't know how to go about getting it. It's just like in your modern time now, if you look out your window and there's a stop sign, but you see the tree that grew so much, the foliage that got so much, it's blocking the stop sign, but you don't know who to call to have them come cut the tree back. Well, that's what the way they were about trying to get food and clothes for their kids. So I took it upon myself to get my merry little men and we started hitting the freight trains. And by me hitting the freight trains, it was God Almighty that said, it's part of the master plan, Johnny, we're getting you in shape. Because the police used to chase me every day <laughs> across that bridge, 155th Street Bridge. And I would have two crates, one on my shoulder and one under my arm, be rolling. And the guy on the bridge, he'd come by and I'd tell him, i say, man, I say, how much money did they pay you for this job? He used to sit in that little booth there, and his job was to open up the bridge. How much did they pay you? He said, they don't pay me enough for sitting in this box all day. He said, I'm sitting here, I watch this Harlem River every day and read the newspaper. I said, well, you see us roll through here every day. I said, the police are going to call you and tell you to open up this bridge so we can't get cross. I said, man, if you give us five minutes 
after they tell you that, every time we roll through, we'll leave something here at the door for you. He said, I can't give you five. I turned and started to walk. He said, but I can give you three. <laughs> we had a deal. Now, these two detectives, and I might add at the time, they were the only two black detectives that I knew in Harlem, Mr. Lester and Mr. Bryant from 32nd Precinct. Well, they used to go to the poker games that my father used to have in the back of the shop on Saturday nights. So they was buddy buddies with my father. And they came to my father one day and said, Earl, there's been some break-ins over at the Yankee Stadium. And uh, we think that Johnny has something to do with it. And you need to tell him. My father put his hand up. He said, nah, that's your job. You need to tell him. He's over there at McCoon's Park right now. That's where they built the new Yankee Stadium. Go on over there. Well, they came over and they told me, he said, man, we need to talk to you. Told my buddies, go sit up against the fence. You have a talent. But before we tell you about this talent, we'll tell you about there's been some break-ins. <laughs> we think we know who's doing it. We can't do anything to them until we catch them. And then they had a swank sort of way to get dead up in your face and say, we're going to catch them. But in the meantime, you got a talent. What's that? You're a runner. Now, when he said I was a runner, you know, I'm in the era when a kid is running down the street. That's secondary to a woman getting her purse snatched. Because my mother had her purse snatched when I was a little boy and she came home with her stockings all torn up, bloody legs and everything. We was all upset, me and my brother and my father. But my mother said, but I got my purse back. <laughs> in other words, she ran the purse snatcher down and got it. So I know where my talent came from. But I was telling the police that I'm the one special. Everybody in the neighborhood runs. And he said to me, he said, no, you're special. And he gave me a number and told me to call the New York Pioneer Club. And I met two fine elderly guys, Mr. Joe Yancey and Mr. Ed Levy. And they told me, say, where's your track gear? I said, what you see is what you get. What's track gear? I don't know what track gear is. He said, well, what you going to do? I said, well, I'm here to train. He said, well, you see them guys over there? They was running something like 660s. For my track guys that's here, they know what a 660 is. I didn't have a clue what a 660 was. He said, go on and run with their run. They was running five 660s. They ran two of them before I got there. Said, they're getting ready to run three more. Well, I jump in the first one, blaze. I got shoes on, so I'm sliding on the floor. I'm blazing with them. They shoot around on the turn, run on by me, and when I hit the straightaway, I catch them again and run on in. So I won the first two. When the third one came around, I'm running, and I never knew they had anything called the bear. I never knew what the bear was until I went to Dave's spot, the pin relays. Well, I was running the bear in, in practice, and this bear hit me, and I passed out. I never did finish the last race. And I remember them taking me outside. It was cold. It was snow on the ground. And I'm coming back around. I hear the old, old guys up there, the older guys, talking about, man, where the hell that kid think he is? He think he just going to come in and just run us. He, he running with cuff and shoes on, too. How does he think he going to do that? He ain't nobody. And I heard one guy tell the other guy, say, man, we don't know who he is today, but I think everybody going to know who he is tomorrow. And when he said that, it gave me the last little strength I needed. So I read stuff, and I told my man, I said, well, I couldn't finish it before, but I'm back now. You want to go back inside? He said, nope. <laughs> That's how my career got started. But as I was telling individuals, when you have something, then the question should come to your mind, what are you going to do with what you have? Now, I was aware that I had this talent as a runner. The question is, what am I going to do with it? Well, I used running as a springboard into what I wanted to accomplish in my life, be it to tell about the sorrows and the ills of people that was less fortunate, to be it to be concerned about the drugs that was dropped upon my neighborhood or the rats and the roaches that was coming in, biting babies up at that time. I began to realize if I wasn't anyone of note, who's going to listen to me? So that was my driving force right there to say, I have to perfect my game to the point where I have the option to either win or lose. <coughs> if I wanted to win, nobody on earth could stop me from winning. The only person could stop me from winning when I felt like I wanted to win was God. Or if I felt like it'd be better served if this individual win, whether it be to help them 
build character in themselves and belief in themselves, or whether I felt it was going to hurt, help the whole scenario. But track and field, as I stated, was just that stepping stone because I wanted to have this vehicle to be able to express to people about the where, whys, and what of certain things. Now, in my career, a lot of people didn't like me. Why they didn't like me? Some people thought that I was just turning the volume up and talking loud but having nothing to say. And you know how you hear that certain times say, hey, man, don't get hung up in the messenger. Get hung up on the message. Well, they was getting hung up on the messenger because I had a certain way I carried myself. I walked like that thug before I got this metal leg. But I remember they was trying to kick me out of Catholic school because they didn't want me to walk in the graduation merely because of my walk, and they wanted to put the book on my head and teach me how to walk. And my attitude to them at that time was this walk God gave me. And saying, if he gave it to me, it's got to be good. But a lot of people was intimidated by the walk that I had. A lot of people was intimidated about the fact that I was aggressive. And a lot of people was intimidated by the fact that I didn't take no shit. And when I say me and take nothing, I got that from my father. Because my father raised me under the theory that if you do something in life, there's rewards or there's consequence. So you had 48 hours in my household to explain what you did. And if you can't make me understand that you did it for the right reason, then the hammer going to come down. Well, I was raised under that. So as I'm developing my skills, I'm looking at my neighborhood. I'm looking at what's going on in the neighborhood. I'm looking at the situation about caterpillars, like you're reading this book here. I had a situation about caterpillars. And I was expressing Max earlier. You know what it is to have a caterpillar infestation? Caterpillars carry a disease just like cockroaches. Only difference is a cockroach has been running since the dinosaur days. It's hard to kill them critters. But a caterpillar will fall on you, and it's so fragile. If you just go to brush it in a bus, and before you can take your hand back, you have a rash on your hand. And I remember going to my mother one day, and I said to my mother, I said, Mom, how come when you come home in the morning from work, you never sit down on the bench and talk with none of the other mothers? Are you stuck up? And my mother looked at me. She said, boy, what did you say? <laughs> like a dummy. Are you stuck up? <laughs> And my mother teared up. She started crying. And she said, I've never raised any of my kids to think they were better than anyone. I never carried myself to think that. I said, well, Mom, why, why don't you go downstairs and sit down with the other kids? I mean, the other parents. And my mother says to me, she said, Johnny, I work in the operating room at Bellevue Hospital. I can't go in there with rashes on me. But I used to leave Harlem and go up to the white area. And we cut through their project. They had the same trees that we had. But in the summer, I would see them spraying their trees every summer. They haven't sprayed my trees since I was a little kid playing in the wading pool. So I said, all right, it's not fair that my mother would have to stay upstairs. Now here I am, I think at that time, I might have been 14, 15 years old. And I went into the manager of the project and I said to him, I said, uh, excuse me, sir, we have a problem. He looked at me, what's the problem? Problem is these caterpillars. What do you want to know about caterpillars? Get out of my office. You know, they feel like you're young, so you don't have no say-so in this game. And everybody didn't have a say-so because you live in the life as well. Get out of my office. So he had a panic button that they hit. And he hit the panic button. Next thing out of nowhere, here come the police and the, and the, the guard from the project. And they come in, hey, what are you doing in here, Johnny? And they grabbed me and wrestled me out. Well, I broke away, and I went back, and I told the manager, I said, sir, you got 48 hours. <laughs> and the cop looked at me, he said, are you threatening him? No, sir, it's not a threat. But it is a money-back guarantee. If he don't do the job, it'll be taken care of. So now I done put myself out there. Now the man doesn't do anything to the trees. 48 hours come and go. My father had a friend that owned his own business. He owned the gas station. Well, I went down to the gas station and talked him into giving me a can and some gas until my father paid for it later. <laughs> and I took the biggest can I can get out there back, too. And I went back into the project, and I told all the women that used to sit down and said, listen, y'all move down the other end and go upstairs. 
all the kids, y'all move to the other pit. Oh, what's Crazy Johnny going to do now? Well, they used to have stick matches. I used to grab a whole bunch of stick matches, stick them in my back pocket. And I took the first tree and I doused it, went to my zipper, <coughs> hit that match, and threw it. And the fire jumped out so much it singed my face. So I ran to the next tree and I doused that before I can get my match out the fire and jumped over to that tree. So I walk over to the other side and I'm hitting the third tree. By that time, here come the fire, the, the, uh, the police and the guard again, but they didn't know. I'm in the midst of getting rid of the Dawson tree. They didn't know whether they should attack me or put the fire out. Well, when they hesitated, I got him. <laughs> then they dove on me, and I had to go to court. Now, my mother was embarrassed. What did you do? Why did you do it? Even though I did it for my mother, my mother would never understood it because that's not the way she raised us. So we go to court. My father's not too happy about having to take off work and go to court, but he went. First thing the judge asked my father, he said, Mr. Collins, did your son have any mental deficiencies? <laughs> my father said, nah, Yana, not my knowledge. He said, well, why would your son do something like that? He said, Yana, I'm concerned about that too, but he's here, why don't we ask him? Young man, why did you do what you did? I told him, I said, I went into the project manager's office and asked him about the caterpillars and asked him, why don't he do something about them? He didn't want to hear nothing. He told me to get out of his office. He pushed the button. The police came and dragged me out. I told him he had 48 hours to do it. If he didn't do it, I'll take care of it. I said, 48 hours came and left, and I'm here because I took care of it. He called the manager up. He said, when last you sprayed? He asked me prior. I said, I don't remember them spraying the trees since I was a little boy playing in the waiting pool. That's at least seven years. He says to me, he says, okay. He said, Mr. Carlson, do you remember them spraying? My father said, not to my knowledge, because my father was in the shoe shop most of the time. He said, but I don't recall them spraying. I wasn't there every day. Is the manager here? The manager comes up. He says to the manager, he says, how often do you spray the trees? Well, y'all, I believe we spray every year. He said, well, do you have your records here with you? And he says, no, sir. The judge was a smart judge. He said, this is a good time to take a recess. He said, but well, upon your return, you bring back your records about how often you sprayed the trees. We go to lunch. On the way out, my father tell me about how I'm getting ready to go to juvenile hall and how it's hard and you put everybody's life in jeopardy and the whole nine yards. So I felt like the villain, you know, your father talking to you like that. But when we got back from lunch, he called the manager up again. He said, did you bring your records back? And he had one little thin folder, one piece of paper. And he said, well, Your Honor, my secretary is out, my clerical lady is out, and this is all I can find. I said, yes, OK. He looked at it. He said, is anyone here from the housing authority? The judge was smart, because the judge took the recess time to make sure he got in touch with the big boys downtown. This guy comes in big, robust folder. He said, uh, how often do does the housing authority get money to spray the trees? He said, they get an annual stipend. He says, well, how often does uh, the Holland River Housing say that they sprayed their trees? He phoned through his paper. He said, well, you're by my estimation here. They signed off that they sprayed every year. He looks at the manager. He said, you guys sprayed every year? He looked back at my father. He said, Mr. Carlson, are you sure you don't recall? So I say, Yana, I say, I go up to High Bridge Pool, to High Bridge Pool every day. I go through their project. They got the same trees, same caterpillars, but he's spraying every day. The manager told him that, come to find out that the man was taking the money, putting the money in his pocket. That's one more situation in terms of people of color, what they had to endure. Why are they spraying up in the white area, but they're not spraying in the black area? Now I'm a young kid, and I'm seeing these things. It wasn't about me being concerned about everybody, but I was concerned about my mother, and that covered everybody. So now, when we get ready to leave the court, my father said some profound things to me. He said to me, he said, son, I was worried about you, whether you was going to go to juvenile hall. He said, I was worried about whether you was going to embarrass the family. He said, but I just want you to know right now, going back to this car, that you made me one of the proudest fathers that you could ever imagine. 
So by that time, you know, I didn't suck my belly up. I stuck my chest out a little bit. <laughs> but he then went beyond that, and he looked at me, and he told me, he said, son, he said, I have the utmost respect for you. Now, you know, for a 15-year-old kid, for you, your dad to tell you about you made him proud, that's one thing. But when an adult parent looks at his child and tells the child, say, I have the utmost respect for you, that's off the chart. So I felt real good. I couldn't wait to get home just so I could boast in front of my mother. Yeah, mom, you didn't want to come. You should have been there. <laughs> hey. But that's what happened with track and field because I was still running in the midst of all of this. Drugs, running through the neighborhood rampant. People come to me and say, man, you want to sell some drugs? You can make some money. Well, everybody want to make some money. But when you sit back and you think about people that were spiking so long until their arms start to look like a monster's arm, and then you look in their mouth and they can't spike the arm no more, so they start shooting inside their gums. Or they shoot behind the legs, they shoot between their toes. Anybody in their right mind don't want to live like that. And when I saw that, I thought about me going as a kid to Adam Clayton Powell's church, Abyssinia Baptist Church. And I remember when Adam Clayton Powell Sr. said, I'm not going to preach a sermon today, I'm not feeling well, I'm going to let my son preach. And his son was a white man. I said, where's his son, Daddy? There he is there. Daddy, that can't be his son. That's a white man there. No, nah, son, that's his son. And then my father proceeds to tell me, he said, but he's not passing. Passing what? He said, no, he's not passing to be a white man. He's proud of who he is as a black man. So I said to him, I said, well, Daddy, are you telling me that, that light-skinned black people are ashamed of who they are? They're not satisfied of their own race? He said, no, nah, son, that's not what I'm saying. He said, although some of them might be a little overzealous, he said, but they're not passing because they're ashamed of who they are. They're passing because they want to have a better standard of life. Everybody deserves to have a good shot at life. And you put that modern text, think about all those individuals that got on them boats and cardboard boats and in the tubes and try and swim in from Cuba or try and come in from Haiti. You think they came over here because they didn't like Cuba or they didn't like Haiti? They came here because they want the same thing that that guy was trying to slide into the white world for. I want a better standard of life. Everybody deserves a better standard of life. When God made this bubble, he didn't put up no borders. God didn't tell me I had to pay $69 for HBO. Man came in and set the stage and turned everything and fused everybody. Now, a lot of white folks used to sit back in the 60s and say, well, man, that's their problem. But see, here we are in 2000, and it seems to be everybody's problem. Because it's not so much about white versus black or wrong versus right. It's about have versus have not. I was fighting that same issue way back then. I went down and spoke at this place called Occupy Wall Street. I call it Occupy the World because it started happening all over the world based on what happened in Wall Street. But one thing about Wall Street, when I went down there and I told them, I said to them, I said, you know the difference with you guys and us back in the 60s? I said, we're fighting the same fight. I said, but the difference is we were very methodical about what we did and how we did what we did. We didn't want to have a situation where we gonna let one individual step out of line and put everybody's life in peril. Like for instance, in Occupy Wall Street, it only takes one guy to say, let's get the garbage dumpster and bring it out here and set it on fire. And that gives the police probable cause to come in and crack some heads and shoot up some people. Fire department to come whip you up with the water hose. So we was telling them, say, if you're gonna do something, everybody got to be on the same page. In Mexico City, we proposed an Olympic boycott. Why did we propose a boycott? Because we don't like America. We love America. All we was telling America is, hey man, in order for you to get love, you got to give love now. <laughs> and we loved you to the point where we went to the wars and fought the wars, gave our lives. 
second class citizens. You didn't show love with that. So now we a new generation, a new breed, and we come and we say, hey man, for all of those individuals that was there before us, for whatever reason they couldn't step up and say the same thing that we saying, we saying it for them right now. So they told me, you don't have a right to say that. You should be very happy that we allow you to go to the Olympic Games to represent us. Well, I should be just as happy for you to allow me to go to your universities, but that didn't happen. I should be just as happy to be able to be self-sustaining, but you don't want that to happen. I should be just as happy to know that when my kid left and went to the public school that he was going to have a decent chance to be successful in life. But we know better than that, don't we? So when you sit back and you think about the Olympic Games, why would a guy as great as Dr. Martin Luther King come out and let his ear swell up to the point where he say, wow, I heard this thing about this boycott, and I was fascinated with it. I was fascinated to the fact that we had some young individuals, not in the clergy, not in the business world, not as educators, but just grassroots athletes want to make a statement. Well, when Dr. King said that right away, my brain is spinning. And I thought about all the transition that took place. Who were the forerunners? Who were the forebearers of that? Jackie Robinson made change. And it wasn't an easy change when you hear Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. Well, they tell you the good side about Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, but they didn't tell you what happened on the back side about what he had to endure. Bill Russell made significant change. When he went into Boston, Boston had a lot of social problems. He went in to play basketball. The first thing they did was break in his house, mess up his thing, and then defecated on his dining room table. But when Bill Russell came out, I said, well, you know, he came to my house, he did some things, let me know that they didn't like me as a black man, I'm thinking about leaving. Then the powers to be in Boston said, oh, hell no, we got to find these guys, and we got to set a precedent. So Bill Russell made a significant change in society. Jim Brown, the same thing. We can go back to Paul Robeson, the same thing. These guys didn't get up and speak out of line, but they spoke the truth. But they all, all of them were ridiculed and told them, say, stay in your place. Well, we was the young breed. We was the new breed. What place? Everywhere I go is the place. But I'm going to speak about being uncomfortable. I'm going to be speaking about how you tried to divide me from someone that was 40 years ahead of me to make them have a different view about how I am. I'm rocking the boat. I'm a radical. And I told them today that I remember that they used to write down that John Carlos is a troublemaker. Oh, here come Carlos, man. Let's leave. He's a troublemaker. Oh, watch out for that guy, Carlos. He's going to do this or he's going to do that. But then, you know, after you hear this word troublemaker for so long, you begin to look at it like it's a cube. And you want to look at it from every angle, every perspective. And when I looked at it long enough, I began to look at certain images I was getting. And the first image I got was a little skinny dude with a sheet wrapped around him, bald head, named Gandhi. And with everything Gandhi did under that British flag, when all the good was said and done, when the dust settled, Gandhi, troublemaker. There's another guy across the water. In Atlanta, Georgia, he read up on Gandhi. He said, this deep dude here, he gave me a whole bunch in my basket. And he started to sell my marches. He started SCLC. He started a whole bunch of people starting thinking that, hey, man, we might have a divine force in our favor. And if we stay tight and hang tough and nonviolent, we succeed. We'll overcome. But after he died, and all the dust settled and you looked up, Martin Luther King, troublemaker. Then you go back to cross the water to Africa. You had a guy that was incarcerated for 29 years. 
because he chose to say what you're doing is wrong and I'll stand to the day I die to let you know I'm against what you're doing. They said, no, we're not going to kill you. We're going to incarcerate you because we want to use you as an image to the rest so they won't be like you. And at the same time in this 29 years, we anticipate breaking your spirit. Well, they never broke his spirit. They never broke his will to be a free man, to see that all men are free. But when the dust settled and he came out of jail and he became the president of the nation, but they still had Nelson Mandela, troublemaker. And then you go to God, the ultimate. Everybody has some spiritual belief. You hear about Jesus Christ. You hear about God. You hear about the spirit. Well, you think about God, the one that's supposed to be the all-powerful. And what he did on this earth, so they say, when he went to the marketplace and kicked all things over and told them, y'all wrong, you pillaging the people, you taking advantage of them. When the dust settled, Jesus Christ, troublemaker. <laughs> so after a while, you know, when I got to looking at it, I said to myself, I said, damn, you know, you in pretty damn good company <laughs> as a troublemaker. But you know, the lesson, the lesson is this. Don't have fear for stepping up to the plate when you know you're right. If everybody's going downstream and you swimming upstream, don't turn down because everybody's going that way and you're going the right way. You got to stick to your guns. And when they turn around and come back up and start saying, man, you know, you was right all the time, don't be upset with them. Open your arms and say, man, I'm glad I'm still here stroking and I'm glad y'all coming in with me now. Because the name of the game is not to castrate, or put people down. The name of the game is to try and raise everybody up. The KKK, when they was running around with them sheets, you know, it's, it's one thing to be in the KKK from their perspective. It's another thing from my perspective because my thing is, let's have some dialogue so I can find out why you're such a coward. See, because you have to be a coward to say that you're going to go to a house and burn a house down with a woman and her kids in the house. Or you gonna shoot somebody in the dark in the middle of the night? And I know why you're wearing the sheets. They said, why do you think they're wearing the sheets, John? I said, well, because my mind tells me that this is just a test run here on this earth. When people die with the KK attitude, the next level, wherever we go, we leave here, the fight ain't over. So they don't want you to see who they are. So they're hiding because they know people like me know that shit can go on the next day. Understand? What individual would want to hide and do those kind of things? So the way that you communicate to them and say, man, I don't have hate for you. I don't have hate for you. I say, but what I do have for you is some dialogue and some dialect that we can sit down and have some open discussion. You sit back, you think about religion, you think about the Catholics or the Christians or the Baptists, and then you think about the Muslims with Farrakhan and them, and everybody want to jump on Farrakhan and put him down. And I tell them, I say, well, man, whoa, how are you going to put people down and you haven't had a forum to sit down and have discussion with them? Anybody and everybody has an opportunity to learn something, but you can't learn anything if you're going to let headlines control your mentality. And that's what happened in 1968. We put our fists to the sky. Why did the world get crazy? They got crazy because this was the first time on planet Earth they ever experienced anything like Tommy Smith and John Carlos did October 16, 1968. What the hell was that? <laughs> they was waking up 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. What was that? <laughs> oh, let's go get our money out the bank. Something getting ready to go down. And then the next day, the headlines were saying, the militants, the Black Panthers, the this, the radicals, the sinister people don't like America. So now with all that they experienced that day, and now they got all this being bombarded on their brains by the white, uh, right wing press. I'm scared already. I experienced something I've never seen. And now they tell me that they're anti-us. If I'm anti-you, how did I make it all this time? 90% of my teachers were white teachers. 95% of my doctors were white doctors. 
85% of my police was white police. 100% of my time as a kid, the fire department was white. So how am I going to get away from you? And at the same time, on the flip side, I can tell white folks, how are you going to get away from me? When you sit back and think about it, if I left, where your shit going to be? If you leave, where my shit going to be? I remember when I was a kid and came up in Harlem. Harlem was multicultural. It was like a fruit bowl. Everybody was there. Italians, the Greeks, <laughs> Puerto Ricans. Everybody was in Harlem. And then all of a sudden, you like, you go to sleep, and you wake up, and all the white folks, like they had a meeting last night, and they said, man, we get the hell out of here. <laughs> Because I saw them the next day, man, they was loading up the wagons, and they had the little pad, pad, uh, station wagon with the patty on the side. Was, you get it in there, Bill. <laughs> Hurry up. We can do it. And they loading up everything. And I'm asking my father, I say, Pop, where they going? What's up? Why are they moving? So, well, son, they're moving out to the suburbs. Took me a minute to figure it out. And the reason why most of the white folks left is because all of the domesticated workers they began to be their neighbors. How you gonna have me in there cleaning up the dog shit and I'm your neighbor? <laughs> you living right next door to me. So they decide we're boogie out of town. And then when I saw them boogieing out of town, as I stated early in the game, my father was an entrepreneur. He had his own business. So when they left, I looked up and I said, oh man, we got a whole black, bunch of black entrepreneurs now, the drugstore, the hardware store, the grocery store, everybody, the cleaners, everybody black face. And then one day I went to the store and I began to check it out. And I noticed, I see this little white guy come out and he go to the register, he don't say nothing to nobody, he walks straight to the register, he take out all the big bills and he make change for 100, put the big money in his pocket and he goes back into the room and then I began to realize that they had a glass where you could look out, but they couldn't look in. And I began to watch and I said, oh, it's a game. They let me think that I'm spending money to myself, but actually they didn't move out the neighborhood, so the money's going out the neighborhood too. These are things that God put these things in my head. Why did he give me to start looking at these things at such an early age? I don't know. But it kind of makes me think that maybe he let me do it because somebody had to have fire in their heart, in their soul, to be able to see it, digest it, spit it out, and try and make other people see it, that we're in a self-destruct mode when we do this. On the verse, reverse side of that, where everybody left, you know when we come together as human beings, anytime we had the major catastrophe, we got a major fire. If New York is burning down or Philadelphia is burning down, I don't give a shit what color you are. A hole that water hole is over here. If a hurricane is coming, help me get my house boarded up. If you're walking down the street and somebody falls out with a heart attack, they don't ask you what color you are. Give me some oxygen. And then once all the major tragedy, emergency situation is over, then we go back to being no separatists again. Now, you know why that is? When you sit back and you think about, we fought a long time for integration in the schools. We have integration in the schools. But in terms of dealing with different ethnicities and different cultures, that's the last thing they teach you in school. So when you go to grade school, little kids love you. I mean, I love you. I don't care what color you are. I don't care if you're fat, skinny, good looking, ugly. You my buddy. Let's play in grade school. When you get up to junior high school, it's a little different. Because now the teachers think you're intelligent enough that they give you a little subtle message. You shouldn't hang out with Edwin Roberts too much. <laughs> Watch Edwin. Don't, I don't want you running with him too much because he'll get you in trouble. They start dropping stuff like that. And then by the time you get to high school, everybody's in their set little clique. Mexicans over here. American Indian over here. Blacks back there, whites over here, Hawaiians, Samoans over here. And then when you sit back, where else do you see it like that? In the penitentiary. The 
penitentiary, you go to any penitentiary in America and you will see a high school setting. So this is something that's being taught. And when are we going to come out of that? When you sit back and you think about development in society, it's one thing that God did that was deep. God didn't say, I'm going to give all the heart surgeons, I'm going to make them white. Or the guy that's going to create the formula to help guys that's losing their hair, going to be black. Or Mexicans is going to take you, take care of fungus feet. He said, I'm spreading out amongst everybody. Everybody's going to have some talent. Now, when you sit back and you think about this, suppose we had it on the flip side where white kids felt like, well, I'm so disillusioned by what they've been teaching me in school and telling me about where I'm going after school until I don't go to school, I go through school. Because right now, relative to the black population of youth, we have a large percentage of kids are going through school opposed to going to school. We're in such a quandary that our parents don't even know how to deal with our kids anymore because we let the TV and the boom box and the rap music raise our kids. They tell you it's cool to use the word bitch to the point where they'll holler it all the way across the campus. Hey, you dirty bitch! And think that's cool. And then when I walk up to them and I say, hey, man, is your mother on the campus? What are you talking about my mother? Well, you just call her dirty bitch. Is that your mama? I'll say, because that black girl over there that you just called that to, she looked just like your mama. So if you calling her that, you must be calling your mama that. Didn't nobody tell you that? Nobody told them. And then we're in a syndrome now where I don't talk to these kids because of the fear factor. They might pull out a gun and shoot me. I'm scared to tell them to pull up his pants. You know, uh, they might get out of line with me. Well, when you sit back and you look at it, it's because men are missing in action. And when I say men, I'm not talking about just black men. We've been missing a long time. But I'm talking about in general right now, men are missing in action. You know, I have to remind guys, say, man, just because you stand up and pee don't make you no man. Hell, I'm a man. No, you ain't no man. A man takes care of his responsibilities in his house. That's what a man does, to make sure that the light's going to be on, to make sure there's some food in the cabinet, not when your woman tells you that she's pregnant and then you all of a sudden want to leave home. A man is a man that's going to go to school and pull his kid up and say, man, the teacher said that you're showing your ass out in school, and boy, wait until I get your ass home, rather than go to school and try and defend the kid when you know the kid ain't doing shit in school. Because we have so much of that going on right now because parents are in denial. I didn't raise my kid in the proper fashion, and I'm glad they have schools because schools right now is like the babysitting institution. If your kid get out of line and want to suspend the kid from the school for three days, the parent come to you, cuss you out. Why are you sending them to me? <laughs> I'm sending you because it's your kid. So we don't have anything going with the kids and then give them nothing, then we expect the best to come from them. It's never going to happen like that. Old saying came out of New York years ago. It was called, each one teach one. There's a lot to that. Each one teach one. I'm nobody special. Everybody sitting in this audience, sitting there up there looking at me, and I can go and say, yeah, give me X amount of money, and I'll come and speak. <laughs> I'm nobody special. Anybody in the audience can do the same thing that I did, whether it be on the victory stand or sitting in this chair right here. You know what the difference is in me and most of you guys out there? <coughs> is that I got in touch with the man in the mirror real early in life. To find out who John Carlos was, and what strengths John Carlos had, what goals John Carlos won. And you know what I found? My biggest goal was to make sure that everybody gets over the wall before me. I ain't going to have no problem getting over the wall but I don't want to get over the wall and be by myself, so I try and encourage other people to go ahead of time. You understand? <laughs> no. hey, hey, guys, you know, I told, where you at? Did you, you, you didn't announce that? No. You supposed to announce that. <laughs> hey, guys, listen, do me a favor. When y'all do applause, applause, it really freaks me out. I mean, I'm not here for applause. 
Like I told the people today, you know, God told me when I give speeches to people, he said, man, you talk to them people like you're talking to a million people. He said, at the same time, if you're talking to one, talk like you're talking to a million. If you're talking to a million, talk like you're talking to one. Because my job here tonight is to communicate to one person in this building. One person. God didn't say I have to hit no grand slam. He said, man, just hit one. But then he whispered to my A, he said, but you know you're going to do better than that. <laughs> and I believe that. I'm not here for applause. But I always tell people, if you feel like you must applaud, go in your purse and your wallet and throw jingle up here. <laughs> and, you know, and you want to applaud, throw money. But I'm not here for the applause. So, so holy applause. What, how did you do that? Who was the brother that came and said, if you want to do something, and just say thank you. That's all I'm here for is to make that communication. That's the problem with a lot of people now that they so much into themselves, they got their own ego. That book here, you read this book, David? You read it? All right. I have to talk to David. David is like my hero from the pin relays. You know, they allowed me to come to the pin relays and set a world record over there one year. But this book here is a, says the John Carlos story, and most people know John Carlos as this gallant athlete, like slant slot. But if you was to open this book and start reading this book, you'll realize that that's not who John Carlos is. I'm not letting my ego get ahead of me to the point where I want to talk about my exploits as an athlete. That's irrelevant. That's that, like that springboard I told you about. What I talk about in this book is the most pertinent things that we have to deal with in life. Now, mind you, I didn't negate track and field altogether. And the reason why I didn't negate it all together is the simple reason when people see this demonstration, they see the demonstration, but they seem to forget that I had to go through a process to get here to do this. So I let them know what my character was in terms of records and times that I ran. That's the only thing that I have in there relative to my, my athleticism because that's not important. What's important is what you're going to do with what you have. All right, that's the end of question one. <laughs> so, I... Uh, <laughs> so I, I will open up the discussion to questions from the floor, but I just, as a historian, I just, I just want to make one observation. Sure. Take us back to that moment. And just stress how important it was because, and how difficult, because although you had the boycott planned ahead, several obstacles had come in the way. Martin Luther King, who you met and inspired you, was, had been assassinated in April of 1968. Right. The issue of South Africa, which was a central part of the boycott, was removed, and therefore the boycott was losing traction. Right. You were facing a head of the International Olympic Committee who had a reputation for racism and anti-Semitism. You uh, had gone to uh, Mexico without Harry Edwards, who was the leader of the Olympic <laughs> Project for Human Rights, which politicized the movement and, and was behind the boycott. So you had, it wasn't just that this was difficult to do, but you already had four big obstacles already. And this is what makes the Black Salute so extraordinary, because at the moment when the movement was going to lose it's speed, lost, uh, you well, picked it up. You know, I, I talk about God a lot, and, and, and I can, I'm going to continue doing that. Because when he's talking about this demonstration, I was born June 5th, 1945, for October 16th, 1968. That's my main purpose to come into this planet was to do that demonstration. Why do I say that? When I was seven, eight years old, God gave me a vision one morning. Early in the morning, my wall lit up like it was a movie screen. Freaked me out then, freaks me out now. Just even talk about it. But God showed me, not as a teenager, not as an adult, but a seven-year-old kid on a box. And I'm in a forum. I didn't even know what a stadium was, but it was a bunch of people in the stadium just like you. 
It was all, as I say, yippee ki yay, and they was excited and happy about something. <laughs> and by the time it dawned on my little brain, said, man, ain't nobody out here on this box but you. They must be applauding for you. Now, I'm right-handed, but I went to wave with my left hand. I got my left hand up about that high to wave to the people. If you think about that, that's about as high as it was in, in the demonstration, too. Let me know something then, but I didn't know. But everybody started changing the flavor from being excited and happy to anger and violence and hatred. When they started spitting. They started throwing things in this vision. They started name calling. They started reaching and sniping at me. It shook me up so bad all day long. All I could do was think about that vision. We went to dinner. We used to go to dinner every night between 5.30 and 6 o'clock. That's what we used to do. The families used to have family dinner. And I remember going to dinner that night. My father looked at me. He said, Johnny, what's the matter? I said, Daddy, I was in a movie. I was in a movie. He said, you was in a movie? I said, yeah. He said, what happened? I said, Daddy, it's, they, they was happy about something I did, and then they got mad at me. And they started throwing things and calling me names and spitting at me. And I'll never forget, my father reached over and bore me into his chest, and he said, son, he said, no one's going to bother you. He said, my job is to love you, protect you, house you, and feed you, and make sure that you get a good education. Nobody's going to bother you. And I remember he looked over me, and he looked at my mother. He looked dead in my mother's eyes. He said to my mother, he said, bye. It looked like God got something special in mind for this kid. We're going to have to wait and see what it is. Fifteen years later, and I don't know what date it was. It could have been October 16th back at that time. But 15 years later, the exact same thing that happened in that stadium happened in that vision. That's why when you see that statue and you, and you look and they show you the back of the statue and you saw me back there with the thumbs up, that was real in Mexico. Because I felt like, hey, this is what my calling was in life, was to go to Mexico City. The greatest thing I think that happened since that time is that the world has settled enough where we have a forum where we can come out and try and make everybody have some sort of understanding and be inclusive in what took place that day. Yeah, we had Amy Bronze that was spilling, the, you know, hatred. Amy Bronze was one of the Nazi lovers. He had his thing going with that. But then remember what I said. Most people, if not all people, believe what they read in the paper. They read Amy Bronze was the greatest thing since gumdrops. I come out and say, A.B. Barnes is not what they make him to be. I'm the villain now. <clears throat> so when we were talking about what A.B. Barnes was doing, nobody wanted to hear that. We talked about a potential boycott, about what was going on. Even our colleagues that was out there running track with us, they said, man, I understand what you're saying. I feel what you're saying. But I'm not ready to step up and say I'm willing to sacrifice my opportunity to go to the Olympics. I trained all my life to go to the Olympic Games. I promised my community I was going to win a medal. My church is counting on me. I told my mother and father, my kids is counting on me. We didn't have the right to tell near one of them, say, hey, man, forget all that. You have to boycott the games. All we could do was lay the cards on the table and say, man, this is a decision that you're going to have to make. You got to decipher it, and you have to make a decision yourself. Many individuals got caught. They didn't know whether to fall to the left or fall to the right, so they thought they could stay neutral. And I tried to express to them, say, man, you could get a chicken and put him on the fence. If he dropped that egg, it ain't going to stay on the fence. It's going to fall to the left or it's going to fall to the right. There's no midway in a pregnancy. A woman going to be pregnant or she's not going to be pregnant. If there's a young lady tell me about the BSU in here, about the kind of indecisive, and if anybody here from the BSU, let me tell you right now. Say, man, you can't be neutral. You have to make some tough decisions. You're like the president to say, being the president of the United States, you have to make tough decisions. Well, you're the president of your household right here, and this is your house. And you have to make the tough decisions. A lot of those guys that didn't step up to the plate at that particular time, 44 years later, a lot of them wish they had a still steadfast. And we did it because then all the accolades that I'm getting that I don't really feel that I deserve because I just did what I felt was right. And when you're doing right, you don't have to be publicized about doing something that's right. But I think a lot of them right now would like to have the accolades that's being bestowed on Mr. Smith and I right now. 
And me add, there's two black faces, there's a white face up there too. And that guy, Peter Norman, one of the best people I ever met in my life. I could call him my brother from another mother. <laughs> but he is definitely my brother. And if anybody, before Peter left this world, if Peter would have called me and said, hey, man, they're coming to try and get me, well, they'd have had to get both of us because I'd have been right there at his side. See, Peter didn't have to stand there and do what he did. And then you go back to God. God didn't have to send us Peter Norman. He could have sent us 10 million other white guys would have said, man, your ass is crazy. You think I'm going out there in the victory stand? Y'all going to do what? But Peter Norman said, my parents were Salvation Army workers. We believe in humanity by trying to make it a better place. Peter, would you like to wear an Olympic Project for Human Rights button? He reached right away for mine. I had to pat him. You can't get this one. <laughs> but mind you now, here's the kicker. After we did the demonstration, the Olympic Games was all shutting down. And we were going back to our respective countries. And we came back to America, Mr. Smith over here, Mr. Carlos over here, and the demons is in the middle. Well, the demons said, let's go find Tommy Smith and beat him until we get tired of beating him. When they got tired, they said, I'm tired of beating Tommy. I ain't tired of beating. So let me go on the other side and find find John Carlos and start beating him down. So they can volley back and forth in terms of the suffering and the agony and the torment that our families had to endure. But when they was on Tommy, I had a break. When they was on me, Tommy had a break. But merely because Peter Norman stood on the victory stand as a human being that had great concern and love for humanity, he didn't stand there and raise his fists he didn't stand there in a slouch attitude. He stood there at attention and proud and had a button on that said Olympic Project for Human Rights. Well, when he went back to Australia, and mind you now, in 1968, Australia was running parallel to South Africa mm. with their mentality. Yes. No ifs if, and buts about it. There was racist as they were in South Africa in 1968. Now, when Peter Norman went back to Australia, they did everything that you can imagine to them. I think all of us lost our first wives. My first wife took her life as a result of it. Peter Norman's wife left him. Tommy Smith's life, wife left him. Lee Evans' wife left him. All of us lost our wives, our families. But then they began to break down on Peter to the point where they said, all right, we're going to mess with your employment. We're going to drive you to drink. We're going to drive you to nervous breakdowns, and we're going to drive people away from you. All we want you to do, Peter Norman, is denounce them two black guys that you were standing on the victory stand with. Peter steadfast. He said, man, I can't denounce myself because I am them. Now I sat back and thought about how deep God was to send Peter Norman to us. All right, Bill Toomey, he would have never did that. You know, I don't have too many white guys on the team that I can point to and say, I have no doubt in my mind when the truth come, the time come, that they would have stepped up. They never did it. So Peter Norman is a hero. Well, I told the people in Australia when he passed and I went to his service and I got up and I spoke, and I told him, I said, Mr. Irwin was the animal king. Everybody know Mr. Irwin used to be on there kissing alligators and doing the whole nine yards. <laughs> well, he died the same time that Mr. Norman died. And I told him, I said, you cannot tell your kids about Mr. Irwin, the animal king, and not tell them about the king of humanity, which is Peter Norman. See, they don't want you, for white folks, they don't want you to know that here was a gallant white guy that stood like Robin Hood and went to the marketplace like Jesus and kicked the baskets over. And then when they told him, I said, man, just denounce him. And you can have anything. You know what it's like to have an Olympic Games and you the greatest sprinter that ever come from that country? And they have the games and that country. 
and they wouldn't even never acknowledge him to the point where he could walk across the field and wave to the fans, or they'd never let him carry the Australian flag into the stadium. They debunked him, kicked him to the curb, wouldn't even let him get a ticket to the games. And now in his demise, now they sit back and tell him, uh, well, Peter Norman didn't have no problems. Like, I can call Peter on the phone now and say, Pete, did they say you ain't no problems? Is that true? No, Peter went through hell. But he never backed up. He never denounced us. He never turned his back. He never said one negative thing about us. He never said, ouch, when he was doing it. He didn't sit back like a lot of guys I heard along the way and say, why me? Peter's attitude was, why not me? So, guys, what I'm saying is we don't have no special ingredients in us. We came from the same hole you guys came from. We're going to go to the same ground or we're going to go to the flame, same flames when it's all said and done. It's not about, you know, what happened the day you came to this planet. And they're shying about what happens the day you leave this planet. But you can be judged in between those two days as to what did you do as a human being in this life. Because the life that you live right now, it ain't for you. It's for those that's coming after you. You might sit back and look at the sky right now, and I look at Mr. Douglas over here, uh, you know, Mr. Douglas, can I have you stand up for a second? This is the oldest Olympian around, Mr. Herb Douglas. <laughs> now, now, Mr. Douglas was in the 1948 Olympics. 1948, I was three years old. He was out there winning, <laughs> winning my medal because he got a bronze medal ahead of me. But I'm so honored to know Mr. Douglas because where I had voids, I could have conversations with him and I could fill those voids and try and put the map together to see whether we advanced or whether we stood still or whether we slid back. And the thing is that we have a bond. You know, track and field people have a tremendous bond. You know, long after the sports is gone, we have a bond. You know what the greatest thing for Mr. Douglas was? He's 90 years old. I'm 67. And we went somewhere, and the guy asked me for an autograph, and, and then he went to Mr. Douglas. He said, could I have your autograph? He said, what, what Olympics were you guys in? Y'all was in the same Olympics, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was wondering whether it was because I look as old as Mr. Douglas should look at 90, or whether he look as young as I look at 67. <laughs> So he liked to say, I look as old as he did. <laughs> but question three. No, I will, I will at this stage open it up okay. so that we get the audience. No, we're not answering any of your questions. Let me ask you a question. Did you really believe that um, Peter Norman was going to be in the top three? Yes. You know, you, know, you know why I believe he would be in the top three? Yeah. Because he had good game as a runner, but even more than the game, he had that swagger about him. I like the fact that he <laughs> wasn't backing down. Okay? Yeah, I thought he was going to be there. I saw Peter in Australia when I went to Australia early in 65, I think. And I checked him out running over there, and he had good game then. I didn't think it would be no problem for him to get in. I think you was a little surprised. <laughs> <laughs> When we were coming underneath the tunnel mm -hmm. with Tommy, you and I, you, you all said to me, Latin Louis, are you going to join us? We have something for you. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is Latin Louis because you all thought I would be in the tunnel. You would be there, that's yeah. right. And I thought that you were going to be behind me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, but that, 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 that was the game when we went inside. Hey, hey, hey let, me just, let me just say this, man. You know, my, my athletic ability, I think I did a superb job. Good, yeah. But I'm not going to say I did the best job because I had a lot more in me. You know, I was just dealing with issues. My premise of going to the games was, man, for the demonstration. I don't think that I ever considered going there to say I had to win. Uh, I had to make the victory stand. 
You know, that's why you saw me turn around telling Tommy, stop bullshitting if you want this medal and come on. Uh, because I, my personal belief is I felt that had I won the race, Tommy wouldn't have got up here and did the deal. So he liked medals. Let him have his medals. You know, I don't need a medal to know who I am in the sport. You know? I mean, I just, I, I, I don't think there's no athlete in no sport could have had more love and friendship and just good times. I don't think there's no athlete out there that had more than me and had more love for a sport than I have for track and field. That's why when I do certain things and say certain things, people don't understand. They say, man, you talk about the drugs in the sport, and you talk about this in the sport, and you talk about that in the sport. I said, listen, man, let me just say this to you. First of all, I have a vested interest in the sport because I'm one of the pillows of the sport. There ain't no ifs, ands, and buts about it. They can't erase me. They tried to erase me. They can't erase me. And I tell them, I say, man, evidence is just show how many bronze medal winners you know that everybody think his medal is shining more than the gold medal, OK? But even greater than that, man, I don't want my sport to die, and I don't want it to sizzle out because people are turning their back and walking away. You should be highlighted. Norman should be highlighted. Herb should be highlighted. Every Olympian that's out there should be highlighted. Because when you sit back, you think about football or baseball or basketball. It was two sports in the world that was paramount. Track and field first, because any sport that you got involved in, you had to do some running. If you swimming, you running. If you playing table tennis, you running. You had to run. And then the birth child of track and field was soccer. Soccer ruled the world, but track and field was still over soccer. And then all of a sudden, the guys seemed like they just lost their luster for it about the sport itself and started looking more at the dollar. And then you see track and field starting to go down. All those sports that I mentioned, basketball, football, baseball, every last sport that I just mentioned that give their right arm to be involved in the Olympic movement. Football, before I die and leave this world, they're going to have football a part of the Olympics. <laughs> Just like baseball was a part of the Olympics. Only reason why baseball left is because they, baseball said, we don't want to give you none of our money. We got our own money. But everybody wants to be a part of the Olympic Games. And every sport that I mentioned, they use their paramount athletes to make the sport expand and explode. Baseball, they still talking about Mickey Mantle. Jim Brown been out of football how long? They still talk about Jim Brown. You know, Walter Payton's gone, they talk about Walter Payton. You go into swimming, they still talk about Mark Spitz, even though we got Phelps. But then when you sit back and you think about track and field, who do they talk about? A bunch of druggies? and try and make me where I'm supposed to be happy and pleased with it. I'm not happy and I'm not pleased with it. And anybody that try and tell me that I should be, they mistaken. You don't know how much joy and how much laughter and how much excitement I brought the people in the stands where I would go up in the stands and drink a little wine with the fellas, kiss the baby and take a picture with the baby. Go hang out with the girls and take pictures and then tell them on the way down the steps, hey, I'll be back in about nine seconds. <laughs> and run all the way down the steps and jump over the fence and run just like I said, nine seconds. Or have a guy tell me, say, man, you ain't nothing. So and so gonna whip you. And I'll stop and say, what'd you say? I was running down the steps. What'd you say? Somebody gonna whip me? I say, I'll tell you what, man, you got a cute girlfriend. <laughs> Why'd you bet your woman? You so sure they're gonna whip me? Bet you a woman. Is that a bet? Yeah, I bet you. And I'll jump over the rail and I'll run down to the starting blocks. And as I'm going by in the 100, as soon as I get to his section, <laughs> grab his girl. Come on, baby, we got to go. Okay? So, I mean, I have a vested interest in the sport. And for, for track and field to disintegrate, and for those individuals that have the genuine love for the sport, imagine how depressing it is for us. You know? A lot of guys, they're not as vocal as me. They don't talk about it. 
But I look in their eyes and I can see the pain. But it's like, we're helpless. What can we do? I don't run track and field. A lot of people look at me and say, oh, John Carlos is like a red flag. You know, you know, tell him what he might say. And they want to run away from me. But my heart is as pure as gold in terms of trying to get it done. I'm one of the nicest guys that you want to meet. But make sure you don't step on the wrong toe. Because I can change too. When you, know, you get tough, I can get tough. But I'm about bringing love into the game. But certain times, you got to swell up and let them know, like I had to tell the man, you got 48 hours to straighten the problem out. Right, Dave? I mean, as long as you know me, you know I've been on the up and up. I'll come to you straight, let you know what I think. And if you go with it, fine. If you don't with it, fine. But I express what I had to express. And I can respect anybody that come to me the same way. Get it off your chest. But when all is said and done, when you sit back and you let drugs not only destroy track and field, but let drugs destroy sports in general. And that's what's happening. You know, years ago, they used to have that commercial, is it real or is it Memorex? Well, that's what you have to look at when you watch sports today. Those that you think was your hero, oh, you're knocking them out the park. And then all of a sudden, bam, he was a dope all that time. And then the way they use race involved in the drug situation. I like to use a couple of people right now, like, say, Barry Bonds. They say Barry Bonds was using drugs. I don't know whether he was using drugs or not. I know his head got big. But then, at the same time, you sit back and you say, all right, they had Mark McGuire. Mark McGuire used drugs, him and Sammy Sosha both. But when they asked Mark McGuire, I said, Mark, did you use any drugs? I don't care to talk about it. No more said. Then you sit back and you look at the picture, Clemens, is that his name? Roger Clemens. Now here's a guy say, man, I got the DNA with the hypo needle, with all the H2 and whatever in there. I got his blood content. I saw it with my own eyes. I shot him with the shit. And then they come back and tell you, oh, well, Clemens is clean. And that's the end of it. We don't talk about it no more. I didn't see when they had the hearing, and all the congressmen that was in there talking, I didn't see them come up with defense of Barry Bonds like I saw them come up for Clemens. I thought Clemens was bonding the manger the way they was defending him. And now he's 55 years old talking about I'm out there, I'm coming back. Or then we can go on to the other guy. What's the other guy with the cyclist? Lance Armstrong. I'm the king. Understand? Now mind you, don't get it twisted. He did a great thing for anyone that struggled with cancer. He gave people that was fighting cancer, he gave them hope and the desire to fight. But then when you sit back and say, all right, let's get away from the cancer episode and let's get into, were you using any steroids? Oh, no, so that's against the rules. I would never use steroids. And anyone say I'm using steroids, they're a terrible liar. Then when everybody else was getting kicked under the bus, and they go back to Lance and Lance, they're whispering your name. Well, they was whispering my name. Even to the day when everybody know the man was on drugs, he still denounced it. So we got to get rid of double standards and say, if we're going to stop this thing, we're going to stop it. If I remember correctly in England, when they was first getting the games, headlines came out and said, we're going to stop the drugs. We're going to bust a lot of people with the drugs. We're going to do blood tests. That was a talk. We're going to get them. We're going to do blood tests. And then somewhere along the way, that statement dissipated. And somebody kicked it up under the table. And when they kicked it up under the table, you never heard of one person doing a blood test in the games. Because somebody whispered and said, man, if they do blood tests, the games are going to be cut in half. Well, these drugs is destroying athletics. And Big Dave, as sure as you sitting there, and you're a historian in the sport, if you go back and you check Jesse Owens' day, and you say, what was the 100-meter time before Jesse Owens break the world record? And how many years ago was that record before he broke it? Then go after Jesse Owens and say, how many years after Jesse did it take before somebody broke his world record? And so on down the line. And if you look at war records a day in track and field, they break them every week. So what are we going to go down to zero before we realize that we made a mistake in the 100 meters? 
because that's what it's coming to. When I can see the average woman run 100, oh, the superstar woman run 100 against the average man walking down the street. No, I'm right now at your old age. <laughs> the, the number one woman that's running 100 right now, if you walk through the park a couple of times, could she beat you in 100? That's because you're comatose. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point that I'm trying to make, the young lady Flojo, when Flojo was out there doing her thing, the average teenage male should be able to beat any woman anytime in 100 yards if you have a healthy body. She was beating three quarters of the American males in 100 meters. That's not normal. And if you think it's normal, I tell him, I say, man, you, you look at B Boat. I say, Boat's pretty much about the same size as Tommy Smith. I say, what's the difference in Tommy Smith and Boat? I say, the same size? You think Boat got more desire? And I ain't saying Boat is drugged or he ain't drugged publicly. <laughs> okay? But what I am saying is this. If you were to take a, a 100 meters and rope it off, and make a shoot. You put a giraffe in one shoot, and you take a wild boar and put a wild boar in the other shoot, and you train them to run that hundred. I can ask the audience who would win. Who would win? Giraffe? Did you say giraffe? <laughs> well, what's that song that, that, that show they have on TV? It's like, Rah! No, the giraffe wouldn't win. And let me tell you why the giraffe wouldn't win. If you look at a giraffe, what's the giraffe's greatest attribute as far as running? His legs, right? Long legs. How can that giraffe turn those long legs over that fast? If he was running a mile, if he was running a half mile, if he was running a quarter, I have a better edge to say I bet on the giraffe. So if he was going to run the 100 and win, that means that giraffe should be able to run the 60 and win. The giraffe just not, could not turn those legs over that fast unless he got Kool-Aid. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> or marmalade or whatever you want to call it. Okay? So let's not be deceived about what's going on in, in the sports right now. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because it goes beyond Olympics because now it's starting to filter out into your kids elementary schools and junior high schools, not to mention the high schools. Steroids is taking over. I've got a couple of young athletes here, including a girl back here in the middle that had a knee race last year. What would you say to them who are really excited about sports and, and track and field? What would I say to them? Tell them, first of all, they are the greatest sport on planet Earth, <laughs> and they should be very happy to be a member in track and field. You 12 years old? Man, you a big 12, man. Step out here. Step out here. Come on out here. Come on up here. We want everybody to see you. Come on down here. Well, first of all, let me say congratulations to you. All right. You see that man there? You know him? Well, that's the man that puts on the print relays every year. Go over and shake his hand. <laughs> and, say, baby girl, say, look here. Look at him and tell him, remember your face, because he's going to see you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in, in essence to your, your, your statement about this young lady, uh, as I stated, she's in the best sport on planet Earth. And all she had to do is realize that God gave her God-given talents. All she had to do is work with the talents that God gave her because there's no team in the Olympic Games, in my estimation, and a lot of people's estimation, was greater than the 1968 Olympic team. Those guys that was out there and those girls that was out there running, 99.9% .9 of them, I can guarantee you, was clean. They enjoyed the fact that they was out there in competition. They enjoyed the fact that they not only was
turning each other on on the field, but even greater than that, the fact that they was turning the people on in the stands, they was electrifying them. The greatest feeling in the world, baby girl, is to say, not so much about what I feel, but what the people feel about me relative to what I'm doing. That's the greatest thing. Because when you're running, you're actually running for them. You're getting the rewards, but you're running for them. Because they go home and talk about you long after you didn't forgot the race. Did you see her? <laughs> and she looked like she was clean, clean, clean. <laughs> and I'm going to be there and say, and she was. OK? I didn't, I didn't do anything track and field but to have me a good time every week. I remember when I was in high school, I guess I should say this is legal. <laughs> when I was in high school, you know, I used to get my wine thing going on Friday nights. <laughs> you know, we had to party and I'd go out there and drink my little Thunderbird and have me a good time. But as I stated to somebody earlier, I knew the job that I had to do. Like we was at the trials and I broke the world record in 100 meters and a guy came to me and he said to me, he said, well, John, you broke the world record. What do you attribute it to? I said, well, man, I had some scotch and some milk yesterday. <laughs> and Olin ran up, Olin said, man, you can't say that. You can't say that. I said, but Olin, it's true. But the deal is this. I never, I never participated in no activities until I got myself in shape. That was the most paramount thing to make sure that I was in shape. And when I say in shape, I mean in shape to the point where I didn't have to go out and train after I got in shape because I was using my track meets to stay in shape. But I wouldn't let nothing get in the way. Once I got in shape, yeah, I'd go out and throw my wine down on Friday night. You rest assured when the gun went off on Saturday, I was there and I was coming on with the iron. Places didn't matter to me about whether I won first place, second place, or third place. But one day I went home and it mattered to my father. My father was behind there banging them shoes. And he said to me, he said, come here, John, I need to talk to you. And I said, what's up? Now, mind you, my mother and my father never saw me run one race either on TV or in person. Not one time. But they always heard the accolades. So my father says to me, he says, he said, Johnny, I, I've been hearing from a lot of the people in the community about how well you're doing in track and field. And uh, I'm really happy. And uh, he said, but I noticed that you come in and you give me these medals every week. See, yeah, Pop, they don't mean nothing to me. If I don't give them to you, I'm giving the girls. I don't need no medals. <laughs> so he said to me, he said, well, son, let me just say something to you. And I said, what's that, Pop? I thought I knew everything. He told me, he said, let me tell you this. He said, everybody likes a winner. He said to me, he said, so if you're going to get out there and run, you might as well bring home the gold. <laughs> I looked at him, I smiled, I said, that means something to you? The gold medals mean something to you, Pop? He said, yeah, son. I said, well, you'll get gold from here on. <laughs> it ain't nothing to win a race. It's about what you do in the race and how many people you turn on. I was telling Max, I said, when I first started running track, before I did anything, I got my cotton sweats, laid them on the table, and got me a big magic marker, and I wrote on one cheek, J. I ran over to the other cheek and wrote C. And my man said, why you do that, man? Why you do that? I said, JC, Johnny Carlos. I said, so when I'm jogging out there, I want these guys to get a chance to say, JC, 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 JC. <laughs> I said, because that's, I'm training them, because that's the way they're going to be. Now here, this is for you, Dave, on a serious note. God's my witness. I'm getting ready to go to the pin relays for the first time in my life. I didn't know too much about the pin relays. And I'm sitting up on my father's shoe shine stand, and I got my lips stuck out because I'm in a quandary. I got to do something, and I don't know how to go to my father because I never went to my father to ask him for no money. So I had some money, so I said, well, let me go on and play this number. If I play the number, I'll have a little pocket change. Plus, I can get some shoes. Play the number. Didn't come out. So I really got my lips stuck out now. So my father said, Johnny, what's the matter? I said, Pop, I'm going to the pin relays this weekend, and I don't have no, no spikes. And the first pair of spikes, I never had spikes before. So he said, well, how much spikes cost? And I told him, he said, well, OK, don't worry about it. He gave me the money. And I went downtown and got these spikes. They were some Adidas spikes. Must have been the first spikes that Jesse Owens and them were wearing. And it was heavy. Had, they were bigger than 5 eighths. They was like humongous spikes, right? <laughs> And I'm looking up and said, these are some heavy shoes. And I got on there, 
We went on the train. And I remember the coach said, well, if we got third place, hang in there for third place. I'm running the mile relay. Now, this is the first time in a competition, real competition, that I got introduced to this bear I was talking about. My boy was running, and I said, look, man, if we in last place, if you're 20 yards in back of the guy, we're going to win. So we run our first race. He come back in the final. We make it to the final, get in the final race. Everybody running a good leg, but I noticed that we dropping back farther and farther. So by the time we get to stick, I'm about 35, 40 yards behind. And I see the pack, and I get the baton, and I roll behind everybody and pass everybody up. And I was on the inside. There was a tall, lanky kid from uh, Arkansas, from Little Rock, Arkansas. And he was smart. Every time I would try and go by him on the inside, he'd step in front of me. So I'm doing a hick. So I come outside. He jumped back outside. So we hit the last turn, and I come off that turn and say, I got you now, bro. Try and jump in front of me now. And I shot around him, going down the straightaway. And all of a sudden, somebody shot me with a cannon. <laughs> Boom! I don't know where it came from. I don't even know how it hit me. Next thing you know, I was on the ground, and at that time, they didn't have a tartan track. They had a cinder track. And I remember reaching down and picking up the cinder in my hand, and everybody was hurtling over me. <laughs> they were just trying to get to the tape. And I got up from there, and the coach said to me, he said, man, you know, you was running 44 point on that leg. If, if I had to run it again, I'd run the same way. I said, no, coach, you won't run the same way. You'll never get John Collins to run a quarter again. <laughs> but that was the first experience I had with the pin relays. And I fell in love with the fact that the pin relays, in my estimation, was the grandfather for all the track and field here in the United States. To make it to the pin relays was like going to Mecca. To win like you won in the pin relays, that's a true blessing to be as young as you are and go there and say, I came out with some iron. And then the next time I went back to the pin relays was 1965. It was raining profusely. I don't know whether you was you there at the year day. No. It was raining like crazy in 1965. They had a little guy from New Jersey named Billy Gaines. He's called him Peanut Gaines. Sensation. Then they had another guy that came in from Madagascar, uh, John Louis. He was a, a tremendous sprinter. So Billy Gaines looking at me, and I'm looking at Billy Gaines, and we said, man, it's kind of wet out here. We said, all right, man, we're going to just take it easy until we get to the tape. When the gun went off, homeboy is rolling. I'm looking at Billy, and I hear somebody saying, what the hell is that? Billy looks at me, he's still there, and we look over, here's this little dude, man, from Madagascar. He was on the outside, he was gone. I looked at Billy and said, we got to catch him. He's a foreigner, we got to get him. <laughs> Went up to the tape, and all three of us leaning at the tape, and I won the race because I was the tallest. I fell, scarred myself up, cinders all up and down my back, and old Coach Turner, you remember the trainer? He was cleaning all the stuff on my back, and he said to me, I said, I said, Coach, who won the race, who won the race? He said, you won. And you know the greatest highlight for me in that race? I was getting a pin, pin relay watch. I still have that watch today. And that's the pinnacle of, of sports for me, to go to the pin relays. You're going to tell your grandkids that one day, too. <laughs> There's a question. Sure. The last pin relay when you was down here, you stayed at the Marriott. And I, um, I checked you in. And then we went to... Uh, Cornell West and Tavis Smiley was in town and he told me to tell him to stop following you. And I told him and he started laughing. That's my man. That's my man. That's my, man. That's my, man. But my question is for you is when with the with the stance that you took as far as being a pro. Hold, 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 here you go. You was working at the hotel? Yeah. All right, brother, I know you now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we talking right. a lot. Right, we did, we had a good conversation. Yeah. Um so but my question was for you is uh the stance that you took on, you know, about being active and, you know, uh, civil engagement. And when you look at today's athletes, uh, specifically black athletes, do you believe it has downgraded? Or had they, or had they been bought by corporate America or let the money dictate? What, how, yeah, you you answered their own question. Money dictates. Money dictates and then the small print. Okay, in other words, they tell you you can't think for yourself because you're under a contract. You should have no concern about humanity, your neighborhood, anything. All you have concern about is the track. But yet and still, they got certain people, man, that steps up. Charles Woodson, he steps up to the plate. 
Steve Nash steps up to the plate. Uh, uh, Spreewell like from the Jets. I mean the Giants. What's his name? No, no, not not mm. not Spreewell. Mike, the one that just on that show, the View, not the View. Uh, Strahan. Strahan, Mike Strahan. Yeah, these individuals, they they step up. I get them confused sometimes, man. They step up to the plate and they made statements too. Uh, you know, with uh, Trevion, uh, Trevon Martin. I mean, when the when the uh, the uh, Heat got together and did some, they might have did it a little behind the rule, but the bottom line is that they did it collectively and made a statement to let them know they was disenchanted with what they were seeing. Okay, so there's people out there that's doing various things, but the most of them, man, are they caught up in the money? You know, like I made a statement earlier today about. You know, Charles Barkley, I had to have some words with him about the fact that Charles uh, you didn't want to brag to the people on TV, on national TV, about he lost $20 million in the casino. And, you know, I had to tell Charles, you know, you know, my old man told me, he said, man, if you don't have anything good or smart to say, don't say nothing. And we got kids looking for pads and pimples, pencils and laptops and iPads to try and get through school. And you talking about you gave $20 million to the casino and you got nerve enough to stick your chest out like you did something good? And he told me, well, it's my money. Yeah, it is your money. And this is my thought about your money. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it is, man. You know, you just uh, feel like if I step out of line, man, I'm going to lose. But when you sit back and think about a lot of them, man, because they don't get counsel, it's a lot of them that, you know, like made that money. And as quick as they made the money, man, they're living more poorly now than they were before they got the contracts because no one is mentoring these guys. I mean, you hear a guy gonna go and buy a house and he's spending a half million dollars every year just to cut his grass. And he ain't in the house most of the time. So obviously nobody's communicating to him. So until we get to the point where we can sit down with these young athletes and start to make them have our understanding, say, hey man, you know, like, you have to go beyond yourself and get away from the attitude that you got it going on. You know, put your guns away, man. You ain't in the hood no more. You're in a different element now. You should start thinking along those lines. You think about the basketball player that got situated where he killed the show for that time. Jason yeah, nice dude. And when Jason got involved in that situation, Jason was on the fringe of becoming filthy rich. I mean, he was rich already, but he was getting ready to cross over into some big money. But just based on his mentality, you know, I got the money, I got the power, I can do what I want to do. Yeah, well, you can't do what you want to do when you kill somebody. Whether you kill them by accident or not, you shouldn't have had the gun out from the start. But we have other individuals that go in there and say, well, me and my girlfriend had a fight, so I burned the house down. Or he had another kid go to college and he getting ready to sign because he won the Heisman Trophy. He getting ready to sign with a football team to make big money. And then he busts him down there in Florida somewhere stealing some suits out the store. He getting ready to sign for a contract to buy the store. But he going to go in there and steal some suits. So it's a lot of work that needs to be done. And as young guys like you need to brush up and get yourself together so you could be the brain to go in and sit him down and start talking to him. Because it's about, like I said earlier, each one teach one. We got to make them realize, say, hey, man, you're in a different position than you were when you left the block. Any more? John, uh, there was a report out uh, a day or so ago about track and field athletes looking to possibly unionize to, uh, to be able to have a, you know, a, a, a foothold or make a stand against some of the track and field sponsors, the meat sponsors, to try to try to get more pay, I guess, to be in line with some of the other professional athletes. Have you heard anything about that? And if you have, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think it's long overdue. You know, I mean, they've been vomiting about it for some time. But, I, you know, when they start giving some thought to it, here's some things that I've been saying for a long time. And one, let's look at the NC2A, for, for instance. Let's say if Norman Tate right there got him a scholarship to go to UCLA. Norman's got it all the ways. He's a great triple jumper. He's a sprinter. UCLA said we could use him. But Norman might not have been the best student. He said, got to go take the ATC test. Don't worry about the test, Norm. We get that handled. So they handled that. Now, Norm goes to UCLA, and he sits in UCLA for four years. 
He don't have the ability because they're not getting him really ready scholastically. They got him in there badminton, archery, the whole nine years for four years of nonsensical subjects. You understand? But imagine now, this is what's happening to Norm on the scholastic side. Now let's turn the page and talk about what's happening on the economic side. Norman's a superstar. So when he goes to the track now, they say, Norman Tate, let's sell these jerseys. I'm going to change your thing from track and make you a basketball player. Because <laughs> you'd never be able to sell a jersey for a track guy. But Norman Tate, superstar. So they sell a jersey with his name on it. His scholarship is $85,000. How many t-shirts, uh, jerseys do you think they sold to pay that $85,000 bill for the four years? You understand? Not to mention, every time they come in the arena, they come in because Norman might turn out tonight. How many hot dogs do they sell on the auspices of Norman Tate? Or peanut suppressive? Or not to mention the cold ones. Okay? Then you sit back and say, okay, let's do the flip side. Now, before Norman got there, they might have had three televised games. Now they got 11 televised games with $3 million a pop. What is Norman getting? $85,000 scholarship and a possibility he might get a degree. Because there's no guarantee in the degree that he get, but there's a guarantee in the money that's going into the caucus. I remember when I was running in college, and I used to tell them, people more, I say, man, you know, this is nice what you're giving me about a medal, but you know, I'm a college student. Why don't you give me a laptop? Why don't you give me something that I can use in education? So he said, throw my Al Franken. So we went and got these things, and he came to the athletes, and NC2A stepped in and said, oh, you can't do that. It's against the rules for you to give him anything to help him in college. All you're supposed to do is give him a little plaque or a medal. <coughs> when I run in the AAU amateur track and field, as I stated, when I ran and Norman ran and Edwin ran, we were young, but we were young men. We had families. You know what they was giving me if I went to Europe for two months? That's two months I'm not working. That's two months that I can't pay my bills. And they're giving me $2 a day. It's 100,000 people in the rain standing there screaming my name, Carlos, Carlos, Carlos. If I ask for a nickel a head, you're illegal, man, because you're an amateur. You can't do that. So yes, they need a union to try and enhance these young athletes to let them get some of the money that Norman Tate didn't get, John Collins didn't get. When you sit back and think about the enormous amount of money that's involved in the Olympic Games, let me ask this question to anybody in the audience. Why do they have the Olympics every four years? Any takers? All right, I'll tell you. I'll take that damn long for them to count the money. <laughs> At the end of the count, it's time to let's do it again. It's time to roll again. <laughs> think about it. You know, when you sit back and think about the Olympic Games, you know why America didn't get the games in, uh, in Chicago? It's about money again. It's about money. And the money evolved around TV rights. We wanted to monopolize the TV rights and say we can control TV around the world. And they came and said, no, you, you're American, and you all that, but you ain't going to control this money. So when they had the vote, America was in a state of shock. I remember I was sitting in my classroom, I turned the TV on, and all the people was in the square down there in Chicago. And they said, and the first country to be discharged from the Olympic Games is the USA. And I heard a woman in the audience, because everybody else was in shock. They were just like, and she said, what did they say? <laughs> and they heard the other woman tell her, say, I think they said the USA is out. And they just couldn't believe that the United States would get kicked, kicked out. But you have to realize everything is going up in dollars. Those individuals that's helping the dollars be generated, their salaries are going down. In the middle of the ocean and dumped them. Then they turned the guns on the rest of the students and told them, say, take your ass up in the hills and don't come down until the games are over. If anybody wanted to contest me on this, go to Mexico and do your own research. 
Yeah, life is, is rough, it's raw. But these are the things that we fight against to make it a better place for everybody. How are you doing? Um, you said that, um, that, that track and field um, athletes that, that participate in the Olympics are, are ambassadors of the flag. When, when you um, had all the backlash and response from uh, when you came back to America um, after, after your moment on the podium, did you feel any sort of betrayal? And if so, when and why would that ever leave, that, that sense of betrayal, or has it left? No, I didn't, you know, I didn't feel like there was no sense of betrayal. You know, it was a decision that they had to make. It's their choice. I can't feel that they betrayed me. I did what I felt was right. Like I told you in the interim, in, in, in the conversation, we laid all the cards on the table. We just put it out there from both perspectives on both sides. And you had to analyze what was put before you and you had to make a decision. Now, betrayal is somebody that said, well, I'm against you, I'm anti you. They didn't say that. What they did was take a posture that I'll just be neutral. I'm not saying that I'm with it. I'm not saying that I'm against it. And by them not saying that they was against it, it meant that, man, I'm not willing to sacrifice my opportunity to go to the game and win a medal. And my attitude was, I don't have the right to tell those guys that you have to sacrifice, don't worry about the medal, you have to sacrifice the boy who got these games. That was a choice. I have as much love for the guys that was out there, I would say 95% of them, I was much love for them today as I had back at that time. I don't have no misgivings about the fact that they didn't do it. But as I said in the interim as well, it's a lot of them right now to sit back and wish they had made a better decision than they did 44 years ago. Okay. You had something? Oh, yeah. That one is a question, but almost a challenge. Well, hold your state. <laughs> uh, where do you keep your bronze medal? Uh, you know something? That's a good question. I think my bronze medal is stashed in my garage under 10,000 pounds of nothing. Uh, you know, I, I hit it because I, what I did, I created a time capsule for my kids. But all memorabilia, pictures, DVDs, recordings, medals, all that kind of stuff, I put into a treasure chest. And I just left it there dormant. And I was going to give the medal to my mother. And then I decided, now nah, I'll give my mother something else and, and I'll put this away for my kids. That medal didn't mean nothing to me. And when they came to me in Mexico City and said they was going to take the medal, I told them right out. I said, I don't know what Mr. Smith's attitude is about the medal. The medal had no significant value to John Carlos. I said, but the fact is, it might have every value to my kids. So if you're coming to take my medal, bring the militia. You're going to need them. Okay? You know, anything that I did, man, Relative to that, my kids going to get all that. You know, my uniform that I had, as soon as I got done that day, I took my uniform off and I found somebody from Africa. I said, man, I like that outfit you got on. He said, you like it? You like it? I said, yeah. I said, take my uniform. Man, he thought I gave him the, 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 the what they call that, the mega lotto or something. He was so happy. He's still happy when I see him, when I see him in the various international competitions. But... That's memorabilia, man. That's memorabilia. You know, the thing that I have, uh, you know what it's like, man, to close your eyes and you can project something crystal clear like it's just happening right before you right now? Imagine how many times, man, I close my eyes and I can see that day. Imagine how many times I can see the hate mongers that was coming at me. You know, or to see, you know, the fact that I came back from, uh, South Africa and, and to go to Montreal and, and now Edmonton, Alberta to the, to the uh, uh, Commonwealth Games and then get a call and tell me that my first wife took her life as a result of the fact that she couldn't deal with the, the stress that they was putting on us anymore. You know what it's like, man, to, to be on top of the world one minute and then the next minute, man, it's like you fall from a big pine tree and you said, I ain't worried about falling because there's a lot of people out there that understand, like the Bill Cosby's or the Oprah Winfrey's, that they ain't gonna let me fall. Well, it's like they, somebody cut them damn branches off because they pulled in and I went straight to the ground. But when I bounced, man, I said, it ain't such a bad fall, man. I'll stand and do it again if necessary. You know, the bottom line is, man, they can only kill me one time. But you know what the bottom line to that is? Everybody gonna die question is what you do while you're alive. 
When I leave here, I don't have no misgivings, man. I have a big smile on my face. And they'd be like, you see me like thumbs up, <laughs> job well done. And that's what it's about. When does the time capsule open? Uh huh? Does the time capsule open for your kids? What do you say? When, when does, does it open? Time capsule. Time capsule. When I'm gone. <laughs> 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 See, ain't no good if they open it while I'm alive. <laughs> this is be the last. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was a kind of a question, but a challenge. You're here on behalf of the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned Mexico, South Africa, Montreal, and you know I think there are classes in sports economics. Well, and then you also mentioned being an ambassador. Um, with the State Department, with these different programs, it was more of a challenge to some of the students who have to do a year abroad, maybe consider including you in doing some type of outreach program as it relates to sports with the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. So just, again, a thought. <laughs> more I'm, of a challenge I'm, always, to I'm always available. Just remember after June, you got to write two tickets, because my wife going to travel everywhere I travel. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's part of the contract. When I go, she go. You know why? Because I travel, you know, you, you know, as an athlete, you have an opportunity to travel and see the world, you know, but it's a, it's a sad thing when you look over and you ain't got your companion with you. And then everybody else is out there pulling on you, the groupies out there trying to pull on you. But you know, you want to have your wife with you or your spouse or your girlfriend. So what you experience in life, they can experience it with you. My greatest thing right now, man, is say when I do retire from teaching at the end of this year, that whenever I travel, to be able to take my wife and show my wife some things that I experienced 50 years ago. Come here, let me show you where I dropped that quarter. Let's see if it's still there. <laughs> okay, we this, done? Uh, Last one. Okay. What was the attitude as a sportswoman waving the flag after you won? What was the rest of the team's attitude towards them? Uh, I should we would explain, go ahead, go ahead. Could you explain? The, the references to George Foreman yeah. at a boxing match after the salute, he uh, won and waved the flag. And it, it is an incident mentioned in the book as well, which will be available. Let me tell you something, man. Uh, George Foreman was a friend of mine. George Foreman is still a friend of mine. And George Foreman will always be a friend of mine. You have to take into account, man, I come out of New York, uh, it's off the hard streets of the city. George Foreman was born down there in Texas, just like Tommy Smith. You heard George's story about George was a big brute, and he used to go do the mugging in the whole nine yards. George was a young kid. He was gifted with his mitts. And when George went to the Olympic Games, George didn't know anything about human rights or civil rights or any political aspirations or anything. All George knew was get in the ring and take his head off. But it was a guy that was on the team named Pappy Galt. Pappy Galt was the boxing coach. Now, how the relation come between George Foreman, Pappy Galt, Tommy Smith, and John Carlos is this. Pappy Galt came to me after the demonstration, and he said, John, he said, look, man, I'm not going to say I agree with what you did, and I'm not going to say I disagree with what you did. He said, but what I am going to say is, you have to be able to feed your family. He said, and I have a plan. He said, here's four tickets, two for you and two for Tommy. Let me go back to my God again. By the grace of God, we didn't go to the fight that night. Because not to say Pappy tried and do anything to get us in harm's way, because I don't think that was nowhere near in his agenda. But he just wanted us to be there to kick off what he wanted more. But the fact was, when he pushed the flag in George's hand, he gave George Foreman the flag. If you look at the video, George got the flag, and the flag was down low. And the people in the audience recognized the flag. Now, while they seen the flag, they have flashbacks of the fists. And they, everybody wanted to show their patriotism. Now George got the flag. God bless America. And George realized they were talking about the flag, and he started waving it. Okay. Now, George didn't do anything wrong. I wish to God I could have waved the flag. But I wasn't in a flag waving mood at that time. <laughs> okay. uh, but George has always been 
Let's say, if I was a classifier, I'd say George has always been an off-the-top type guy. You understand? He's a sincere individual. Uh, George and I were very good friends prior to the games. Uh, you know, George got in touch with me 40 years later, maybe 38 years. I went to a golf tournament in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I came home. I was tired. I told my wife, say, I'm going upstairs. I don't want no dinner. I don't want to be bothered. I'm laying down, man. The phone started ringing, and it rang every 30 minutes to the hour. Just kept ringing. So finally, I picked the phone up, and I had an attitude. Who is this? This is George Foreman. I said, yeah, and I'm the king of Siam. <laughs> no, John, this is really George. And I said to him, I said, well, George, if this, this is you, let me ask you a question. What you doing still boxing? Now, I didn't pick up his voice until he gave me the answer. And he said to me, he said, John, that's the same question my wife keeps asking me. And when he made that statement, I said, well, man, it is George. I said, man, what's happening with the biggest and the baddest cowboy I know? And he loved it when I called him a cowboy. So he was telling me that he was in awe of the fact that we were so tight. And he's trying to tell me, thank me for all the wealth and recognition, everything that came to him. I told him, I said, man, God did that. I didn't do it. God did it. Because he was, like, I was on top of the world when I went to Mexico City. After the demonstration, I started making the nose dive, and George started rising. We passed in the way. We didn't even get a chance to embrace one another and say, man, see you next time. And he's been on the top ever since. So George said, man, not a day went by that I didn't think about you and think about your wife because he was supposed to meet my wife and he never got a chance to meet her. Now, George did something for me. You know, I remember when I was in hard times. When I say hard times, I mean no food in my cabinet. I remember I had to go wake my kids up one night and tell them, say, go to the dresser drawer and take all your clothes out. And I got a claw hammer and broke all the furniture up to take and throw in the fireplace because I couldn't pay no electric bill. So that's why I had no heat. And tell my wife to get the kids and we move out in front of the fireplace and they were sleeping in the living room. I told the reporter that and he wrote in the paper, John Collins started a bonfire in his living room. <laughs> Damn fool. But anyway, <laughs> George told me when we hooked up, he said, John, he said, man, I just, I want to do something, you know. And I told him, I said, George, you don't have to do anything. And then he started telling me about, you know, I got 50 cars and, and I had to go to New York City because they had to take the piggyback elevator. They had to make one at the ranch for all my cars because my wife got tired of them. So I'm kind of leaning. I said, yeah, George, my car is the Bentley, the Bentley. <laughs> he said, I'm going to send you something. I kept the Bentley, the Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go away and again and I come back and George say, did it come? Did it come? I look out the window, no, it didn't come. <laughs> so I go on another trip. And this particular time when I got back, I went straight to the post office. I didn't go home. And an envelope opened. I opened it, it was a white envelope. And I see, what's this? And I opened it up. It was a picture with George Foreman and his Panamanian hat with the coins around it, his prestige blue shirt, his buckle with his thing. And then he had an Arabian stallion over his shoulder. <laughs> And he wrote down and he said, to my brother, Johnny Carlos, he said, from your brother, the biggest and the baddest cowboy you know, Big George. And I looked, I said, oh, that's nice. So then I go to read the letter and I take a paper clip off the letter and something kind of faded away. I'm reading the letter. And I start to walk off and I said, oh, something fell. And I went and picked it up and George had sent me a check. And when I turned the thing over, it's like my knees buckled. You know, I mean, I was looking for, like I said, Bill Cosby, send me a dollar, let me help my kids get some milk. Oprah, send me 50 cents, let me feed my kids, you know, that kind of thing never came. Now, here we are, 38 years later, George called me on the phone and said, I want to do something for you. I said, George, you don't owe me anything, man. God got you where you are. But I want the Bentley. <laughs> He didn't send me the Bentley, but he sent me some money. And I'm not going to tell you all how much money he sent me, but he sent enough money to buckle my knees, I'll tell you that. So right away, I'm thinking to myself, I can't accept this. But I took the letter, put it back together, put the paper clip on it. I went home, took it home, and told my wife, say, hey, somebody send you something. 
she opened it up. Oh, she said, Big George, that's a nice picture he sent. And in the letter, he was saying that he was sorry that he never got a chance to meet my first wife and how, you know, hurt he was that she had took a life and the whole nine yards. So I told my wife, I said, yeah, well, read the thing. So she pulled the letter off the back. And she started to read it, and the check fell off the same way, floated away. So I said, hey, baby, something fell. She said, I get it, I get it. She went on, she read the letter. And then I said, did you drop something there? And she went and picked it up, and it was always face down, because when I got the check and it floated down, it was face down for me, too. And she, when she turned over and she looked under the book, I had to grab her. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she said, George, send that. I said, yeah. She said, you know we can't keep this. We got to send this back. So the next day I called George, and I told him, I said, George, I said, man, I love you more today and less than tomorrow. I said, but we can't keep this. And George said, what do you mean you can't keep it? He said, if, if you send it back, man, that would be an insult to my wife and I. We sent this to you because we want you to have this, and we wish we could have sent more. And he says to me, he said, I know you could get your floors done or take your wife on a cruise or clean your car. And I was thinking, I'll oh, buy a Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> But I had love for George, man, and, and I always have love for George because George has always been a straight-up guy. And George is a, a godly person, and he's always trying to help other individuals. You know, regardless of what people say, people talk about George is tight and George is this and George is that. George is just his own man, and he knows what he wants to do. And no matter what people say, I don't see half the people doing what George is doing relative to trying to save some of them kids. So I always have love and respect for him. We will respect your request not to applaud you, but I hope you will permit us. Y'all want to throw something in the hat? Uh, <laughs> aside from that, I hope you will permit us a round of applause to honor the people who brought you to 16th October, the athletes that supported you at that moment, and the legacy that you've generated for the future generation. Oh, I'll go with that one myself. <laughs> Hey, 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 oh, before y'all leave, before y'all, hey, hey, that's all right, before y'all leave, hey, uh, here's another one of my teammates, he's, he's a little younger than Herb, uh, Norman Tate, would you stand up, Norman Tate was in the 1968 Olympics with me. Triple, triple jumper, and I might add, the only guy that ever did the triple jump that beat me in the relay. <laughs> but I might add also is because I had little pin spikes and he had long spikes. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. We spiked him though. We spiked that one. Those places in Harlem, and I'm going to be in touch. Yeah, you, yeah, did I give you my car? No.